Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the Nation Builder. A nation builder is one with vision, a planner and a master tactician. He is a man with a team that understands that the implementation of free senior higher education, for example, requires adequate infrastructure in order not to destabilize an already working quality educational system. This is a man with a team that negotiates deals in a holistic manner, like the Tema Port expansion project that concluded with the construction of the Temamoto Way Interchange for ease of transport of goods. This is a nation builder, one who makes judicious use of resources at his disposal. There are several infrastructure projects in various sectors of the economy accounted for under John Muhammad's four years of governance. This nation builder is trustworthy, one who is faithful to his promise. John Mahama promised to end Dumso, and truly, he did, leaving the nation with excess megawatts of power at the end of his first term in office. This nation builder is a unifier. John Mahama's leadership transcends ethnicity, family, and friends, one whose message resonates with the upper class right through to the grassroots of our society. Same can be said about his communication prowess. It's unrivaled. This year's elections will be about track record. Second is trust. The writings are clear on the wall. The records never lie. Fellow Ghanaians, the choice is ours to make. Fellow Ghanaians, Presenting John Dramani Mahama. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My uh, wife and life partner, Nordina Dramani Mahama. <laughs> Professor Nana Jane Opoko Ajman our 2020 running mate, Alhaji Mahama Idrisu, representing our founder, Jerry John Rawlings, and our Council of Elders, our national chairman, our general secretary, right honorable second deputy speaker, right honorable former speaker of parliament, the Honorable Minority Leader, Chairman, and members of our National Campaign Team for Election 2020, members of our National Executive Committee, my media friends, our invited guests, party activists and foot soldiers, assorted professional groups. Ladies and gentlemen, on a day like this, we can't help but remember many of our comrades who have contributed their quota to bring us to this point, but who no longer are with us. The list is too long, but I acknowledge in particular my teacher, my friend, my comrade, my mentor, Professor John Ivan Satamils, of blessed memory, my able vice president, Parkwesi and Mr. Arthur, many other of our departed faithful. Kobnai J, our former chairman, Dr. Mrs. Mary Grant, and so many others who are not with us today. We acknowledge them, we salute them, and may their souls rest in perfect peace. This world is changing fast and in truly fundamental ways. Global climate change, migration, terrorism, racial tensions, and lately, COVID-19 are throwing up new challenges that are testing the quality of leadership of every nation. The stress tests nations are going through are revealing fissures based on developmental models and paradigms used by those countries. In many cases, countries considered relatively less advanced with smaller economies are emerging more resilient and less affected by the global shocks than some countries that are considered advanced. The case of Vietnam, a relatively smaller country bordering China, and therefore closer to the original source of the coronavirus pandemic, has survived much better with relatively less infections and deaths than known global superpowers. Therefore, never in the history of the world has the quality of a country's leadership been more critical to its survival than now? Leadership 
that has been proactive and visionary have emerged from the shocks with less effects on their people and economies. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same for our beloved country, Ghana. Our economy is in tatters, and as I said, in intensive care, and we are on track to post the highest ever fiscal deficit in our history since the beginning of the Fourth Republic. Excessive borrowing over the last four years have placed Ghana in a high debt risk category with absolutely nothing to show for it. Job losses are at an all-time high, with layoffs and business collapses becoming the order of the day. The capital and lifetime time savings of small businesses and households have been eroded by the not too well thought through financial sector cleanup. Business confidence is at an all time low, with many Ghanaian businesses struggling to stay afloat. Ghanaians are tired and hungry. While an elite few have access to all the opportunities the nation has to offer, our institutions have been politicized and there's a gradual erosion of our democratic space. Government has clearly failed to contain the COVID virus and has given up providing timely statistics and data on the status of COVID-19 in our nation. Despite the huge resources that have been made available to Ghana by the IMF, the World Bank, and withdrawals from our stabilization fund, government has failed in its COVID-19 alleviation and containment program. Public education has been poor. Food distribution during the lockdown was chaotic and disorderly. Protective gear remains in short supply, thereby putting our frontline health workers at risk. It is critical that we rescue Ghana from the abyss into which it is sinking. My comrades and friends, we must prepare Ghana to cope with the current global challenges. We must open new horizons and new hopes to instill a new sense of purpose in our people, catching up on what we have missed while taking steps to enhance our growth. We must place Ghana in sync with the new developments taking place around the world in order that we prepare our economy to become an advanced one. To achieve this, we must build a knowledge-based economy and move faster into the new world of smart manufacturing and digital services. This will generate not only growth, but prosperity for all Ghanaians. We'll create not only jobs, but sustainable and decent jobs so that people can live prosperous and dignified lives. We must put Ghanaian businesses at the center of our economic growth. It is only when Ghanaian businesses thrive that our economy can grow and create jobs and prosperity for our people. We must create equal opportunities for all Ghanaian businesses and not deal with them based on political color or family affiliation of their owners. My brothers and sisters, I've had the unique and humbling privilege of providing leadership as president, stepping back and being elected again to lead the National Democratic Congress into the December 2020 elections. It has therefore given me the opportunity during this period to reflect soberly on the challenges and expectations of governance and the heavy burden of people's hopes and aspirations that come with it. Ghana cannot afford to do things the old way. Survival and success for today and the future generations require a much more urgent and in many cases substantial change to prevailing economic and social relations. Ghana needs a new era of social justice. It is time 
for renewal and coming together. It is time for greater self-reliance. It is time to close the wealth gap that divides our society and create greater equality amongst our people. It is time to finally end intolerance and social discrimination against ethnic groups, religious groups, gender and age groups. It is time to end repression of the media. It is time to unite and create opportunities for all our people and not just a privileged few. It is time to do this democratically with the full involvement of all our people. With this in mind, we set out to develop the People's Manifesto, a social contract between the NDC and the people of Ghana to make our manifesto writing process widely consultative and popular, we adopted a bottom-up approach. In addition to internal consultations within the NDC, with our grassroots organs engaged, their communities, we forwarded their expectations to our manifesto com co uh, committee for inclusion. I was also privileged to hold town hall meetings with representatives of different socioeconomic groupings. I sought to derive a consensus on what the new NDC government must do and how we must do it, and what role citizens want to play in our forward march. I want to thank all the professional groups that gave us a hearing and contributed meaningfully to this document that we're going to launch today. The idea was to distill this knowledge that we acquired from them and make a commitment in our manifesto to the people of Ghana. Our consultative process was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We did not, however, abandon our objectives. We continued using technology and small group meetings to further these consultations. Six months later, the pandemic is spreading even faster with more disruptive effects on our lives than the current government had anticipated. From all indications, COVID-19 will continue to plague the world for some time to come. But this manifesto lays the foundation for the renewal of our institutions and progress for all. It is my hope that you will identify the ideals of our People's Manifesto and vote for John Mahama and for the great NDC team and engage us with a view to holding us to our commitment on program delivery. I believe that there are great times ahead for our people, all of us, myself included, learned a lot of valuable lessons during the period of preparing this manifesto. The most important was the growing and humbling understanding of the fact that the December elections will be unlike any other election in our recent history. It will be an election of destiny. It will be an election of the future. It will be an election of the future of our children and our grandchildren. This election will be about the very soul of a new Ghana. Our historic mission right now is to provide our fellow Ghanaians with the opportunity to become a part of tomorrow's world and offer our beloved country a clear chance to spread prosperity to all our people and move into the status of an advanced middle-income country within the next five years. It is possible together. We can do it with the right and dedicated leadership. We owe it to our wonderful people to create new job opportunities, to bring new skills, and to provide better chances for everyone so that all of us will be able to live a dignified life. It is time now, my brothers and sisters, that time is now.
the change the change we all desire starts now let us all join hands to create the country that we wish for may god bless our homeland ghana may god bless each and every one of us may god make our country great and strong and so at this point I'll take you through a few highlights of our manifesto. Not in any particular order. NDC is a social democratic party. We subscribed to a compassionate political philosophy and we believe in social justice. We create opportunities for all to develop to their fullest potential. We focus on an inclusive effort to safeguard the jobs of today and create sustainable jobs for the future. Our manifesto is our social contract with the people of Ghana, and we will create a bright future for Ghana and for every Ghanaian. Our, our priorities are to build a sustainable society with opportunities for all, to promote human development, to continue to pr prioritize health care, quality education, and skills training as the cornerstone for progress and prosperity. The U.S. $10 billion accelerated infrastructure plan, dubbed the Big Push, will create jobs for the multitude of our people. We'll provide infrastructure for accelerated development and we'll fix the economy as we unite against poverty, create sustainable jobs under our EJUMAPA program, promote good governance, integrity, anti-corruption, transparency and accountability, and deepen the inter international relations amongst our sister nations. Uniting against poverty, that is the economy. Ghana's economy is not working for the people, it's working for only a few. Ghana's economy is not working for the people, it's working for only a few. We will, we will fix the economy and make it work for all Ghanaians. We'll fight the disastrous effect of the poor economic management of this administration. The NDC has the experience to turn around this dire economic situation to bring relief to the suffering masses of Ghana. We will sanitize the financial sector. On the macro front, unprecedented mountain public debt, depreciating city amongst others, are all a telltale sign of an economy in deep distress. We will roll out prudent macroeconomic measures anchored in sound management. We will bring the public debt under control. We will stabilize and strengthen the long-suffering city reduce inflation, ensure a low progressive taxation regime, and restore inclusive growth. We'll make the business environment friendly again, provide unprecedented job-related stimulus packages for the private sector, and most importantly, increase Ghanaian participation and stake in our economy. And we'll put an end to the vindictive targeting and collapse of Ghanaian businesses and its attendant job losses. We've done all this before. We ensured the most stable and prosperous period of economic management 
in Ghana's history. We are sure the highest ever GDP growth rate in the history of Ghana. We ensured the longest sustained period of single digit inflation in economic management in the history of Ghana. We, impl we implemented fiscal prudence and for the first time managed the 2016 budget with zero borrowing from the central bank. The NDC established the Ghana Exim Bank to promote jobs and exports. The NDC will again generate economic growth that creates infrastructure and sustainable jobs. We will usher Ghana into an era of shared prosperity, and all Ghanaians will reap the fruits of their labor. We need to turn our beloved country, Ghana, into an advanced one, and we must eradicate po poverty. It is possible, and we will do it. How will we achieve these targets? How will we achieve these targets? We will exempt small businesses from paying corporate and personal income tax. Income tax. That is to re-inject their profits back into the businesses. We estimate that this will involve about 1.4 billion Ghana cities a year. And that will be the best stimulus you can inject back in order to expand small and medium enterprises. For medium-sized Ghanaian businesses, we will reduce the corporate income tax rate from 25% to 15% in order, in order to give them breathing room to be able to reinvest in the, and grow their businesses. But very interesting, we will exempt newly established medium-sized companies that employ up to 20 people or 20 workers from paying corporate income tax for the first year when they are establishing the business. This is important because the most critical time in establishing a business is the first year when you are investing. And when you are investing, it's not the right time for government to come asking you to bring money. And so we will give them that relief. And for businesses that employ 20 or more medium-sized businesses, they will get corporate tax, income, uh, tax exemption for two years so that they can establish the business properly and expand the business to employ more people. We'll exempt commercial vehicles and other commercial equipment imported into the country from commercial industrial, uh, for commercial, industrial, and agricultural purposes from import duty. We will, we will review the Customs Amendment Act 2020, that's Act 1014, to scrap the law banning the importation of salvage vehicles. To scrap, I think Ezu, Eza, Ezu, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To scrap the law banning the importation of salvage vehicles and the proposed, imp and the proposed imposition of a 35% import duty rate. We are going to scrap it and in order that we, uh, 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 salvage vehicles are not banned and the top duty rate that government proposes to impose on these vehicles does not happen. This, this is to save the local automotive industry so that our people in Swami Magazine, Konkompe, Abose Okai,
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. This is to allow our people in the local automotive industry in Swami Magazine, Konkombe Abosokai, to continue to work to earn a decent living. We encourage vehicle assembly plants investing in Ghana as a complement to our local industry, not to cancel out our local industry. We will reverse the decoupling of VAT, 12.5%, NHIL, 2.5%, Get Fund, 2.5%, which has brought untold hardship onto Ghanaian businesses and households. We will introduce a rural investor incentive package to create meaningful employment opportunities for the youth, especially in rural areas, and investors in rural communities. Under this program, they will be exempted from dividend and capital gains tax. And then B, if they employ up to 50 persons, they will be granted tax exemptions and further incentives on the importation of capital equipment. We'll pro provide special tax incentives for indigenous value chain industries, such as mineral processing, petroleum-based uh, industries, agro-based, pulp and paper industries, in order to unlock sustainable job opportunities. Among others, we'll review the Rent Act to provide tax incentives to landlords and real estate uh, investors to reduce the cost of rent advances for residential and commercial purposes. Restructure the Rent Control Office into a Ghana Rent Authority to effectively implement the new Rent Act in the interest of tenants and landlords. We will increase the District Assembly's Common Fund back to 7.5% from the 5% that the current government has, has, has put it. This will make sure that enough revenue goes to the District Assemblies to function effectively and provide adequately for people in the decentralized districts and also for people with disabilities. We will promote local content for local contractors in all sectors of the economy to increase the contribution of Ghanaians to a minimum of 55% of GDP and improve Ghanaian ownership and participation of our economy. Amend the Public Procurement Act to give priority to Ghanaian businesses in the award of contracts financed from public funds. Within a year in office, we will pay the full amount due every victim of the reckless handling of the financial sector cleanup. Conduct a, conduct a forensic audit on the entire financial sector cleanup exercise, including the Ghana Amalgamated Trust. Set up a financial services authority to regulate the financial service industry, protect consumers, and ensure fair competition in the financial service sector. Ensure a well-tiered financial system to cater for the various segments of the market, such as SMEs. The idea behind this is you don't need every bank to have a capital reserve of 400 million. So we'll create several tiers so that there will be banks that want to lend to small and medium enterprises, and a capital reserve of 100 million will be enough for them. Amend the National Pensions Act, 2008, Act 766, to improve both service delivery and financial efficiency of the SNIT pension scheme. Allow contributing workers, such as private teachers, amongst others, who lose their jobs suddenly due to natural occurrences, such as COVID-19 pandemic, to be paid stipends while they search for a new job. And this is important. Allow workers who have contributed for a minimum period of 10 to 15 years to use their uh, contribution as collateral 
to access mortgage loans for housing. We will pay pensioners, we will pay pensioners, and they'll be happy about this, an annual 13th month bonus. Under the Ghana Framework for Industrial Revitalization, Support and Transformation, which we call Ghana First, we will boost the real sector of the economy. And the 16 strategic growth areas are going to be agriculture and agro-processing, pharmaceuticals, health tourism, light manufacturing, including apparel, accessories, and assemblages, educational service exports, financial services, furniture, ICT business services and logistics, oil and gas petroleum sector, strategic minerals, including salt, tourism, tree crop development, coastal landscape and forest management, afforestation, infrastructure, construction, waste management and recycling, and high-tech manufacturing, including chemicals. To stimulate economic growth and create opportunities for sustainable jobs through agri-business, we will realign the Ministry of Food and Agriculture into a Ministry of Agriculture and Agribusiness. This is to capture the full value chain, because we've concentrated only on production, and when we have produced, we don't have the capacity to process the produce and make them available to the market. We'll put Ghana on the path of self-sufficiency in the production of commodities and also for exports. We'll delineate agro-production and processing zones for medium to large-scale production. These include examples like Brongahafo is the leading producer of cashew nuts, but yet we don't have an active cashew processing uh, 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 capacity in Bronga Hafo. And so we'll put that in. There are places that are good at ginger production. We'll process the ginger into ginger powder, ginger oil for export. There are places that are producing rice. We'll put rice milling equipment so that we can mill the rice for the local market and, if possible, for export. Provide microprocessing equipment to farmers, to farmer cooperatives. For instance, in the palm oil growing area, if you give a group of farmers, a cooperative, a small processing mill to be able to process their palm oil for the market. It will add value to what they are doing. In the cocoa sector, cocoa processing for value addition will ensure the processing of at least 50% of our cocoa beans locally before we export. We'll restore the distribution of fertilizer inputs and free fertilizer inputs and seedlings to cocoa farmers. Support small cocoa processing companies and artisanal cocoa products. Process and market finished and semi-finished cocoa products in addition to raw cocoa beans, amongst many others. Um, government support to pharmaceutical industries. Roll, roll out a pharmaceutical industry financial and technical support program. We've done this in the past. When I was president, we financed the pharmaceutical industries to the tune of 50 million uh, Ghana CDs, and it enables some of them to be able to begin to export into the sub-regional market. We will enhance this so that Ghana becomes a hub for pharmaceutical manufacturing in West Africa. We will develop a national policy to restructure the small-scale mining sector. We will set up what we call a gold board. This board will be responsible for small-scale mining sector to provide mining support services and especially in the area of safety. We will attach mining safety officers and graduates from the University of Mines and Technology to all small-scale mining companies to ensure that they do the mining in safety and according to the regulations. We'll train small-scale miners in land reclamation techniques as a critical component of their op operations. We'll promote legally and properly regulated, operated medium and small scale mining to become attractive and well paid business ventures, creating jobs for our youth. We'll reissue confiscated legitimate mining licenses to miners. For persons whose mining concessions have been illegitimately seized, we shall return the concessions to the legitimate owners.
We will track down and take back all excavators that are missing. And we will return the excavators to their rightful owners. We will establish mini gold refineries in the gold producing regions of our country in conjunction with the private sector. And we will halt the export of unrefined gold produced by small scale mining companies. The central bank will play a role in financing and certificating high quality gold bullion for export. We will hold a portion of our international reserves in gold to help stabilize our economy and our currency. Uh, many other things. I will increase demand for locally manufactured goods and will use government's purchasing power to stimulate demand for made in Ghana goods by directing all MDAs to patronize made in Ghana goods. We will encourage the private sector to establish marketing companies to service local SMEs and manufacturers. And then it continues. We will modernize our markets using a mini KJTR model. And so markets like Aflao, Mankesim, Techiman, <laughs> markets like Aflao, Mankesim, Techiman, and others will get a smaller version of a KJTR market. Promote local produ production of hygiene goods, especially for women, including sanitary parts, through training and support for startups. Revive the textile industry by providing support to local textile companies, such as Akosombo and Jopon Textiles. Establish agro processing factories in various districts in collaboration with the private sector, such as food processing in Lua Manya, cashew processing in Bono and Bono East, amongst others. Now the big push, 10 billion, big push. And I'll rush through this very quickly. The 10 billion dollar big push for infrastructure development and economic transformation will involve an investment of 10 billion over five years. It will transform our economy in furtherance of our one million jobs plan. Projects under the big push will be executed in all cases by Ghanaian registered companies that pay their taxes in Ghana. This is to ensure that the money circulates within Ghana. And so if you want to participate, your business should be registered in Ghana and pay taxes in Ghana. These investments will stimulate and grow indigenous Ghanaian businesses. The 10 billion investment will be directed to stimulate the economy by sourcing as much as possible locally available materials and products for the execution of the projects. Now key areas under the big push, provide a, a infrastructure for agriculture and agribusiness such as warehouses, silos, irrigation dams, farmer service centers, etc. Develop regional digital and innovation centers, develop 5G technology, upgrade and dualize all our major national roads. Complete the eastern and western corridor roads. Upgrade other major national highways, urban and feeder roads. Expand the railway network by implementing the 2014 railway master plan. Construct a domestic airport in Upper East Region. The, the land was secured when I was president, and uh, it's a project that we will continue. Extend the runway of the Kumasi International Airport to accommodate bigger aircraft. Upgrade, upgrade the Sunyani Airport. Engineer and construct major markets, starting with Aflao, Mankesim, Techiman, Kintampo, Sam, Sampa, Elubu, Nima, and Asesewa.
construct, construct social housing in all districts of the country, expand rural electrification, water supply, sewage, and sanitation systems, complete all abandoned hospital and health projects, construct new district and regional polyclinics, health centers, and CHIPS compounds in all the districts, construct two new infectious disease centers, expand the 37 military hospital as the national as a national emergency center complete all the e blocks and the abandoned community day secondary schools construct new schools at the basic level by removing uh, schools under trees and other substandard schools provide universities in the new regions that do not have any Build modern theaters and studios for the development and promotion of the creative arts. Complete feasibility and continue the implementation of a specialized port on the eastern seaboard of our country, and that refers to Keta. Construct a multi-purpose convention and exhibition center aimed at repositioning Ghana as West Africa's destination for meetings, conferences, and exhibitions. Refurbish the National Theater. Upgrade NAFTI into a fully fledged multimedia university for film, arts, theatre, and music. Upgrade the National Sports College into a state of the art sports university to serve the West African sub region. Provide sports development facilities across the region, including stadia, mini stadia, and uh, other facilities. Upgrade infrastructure linking tourism sites. Complete and operationalize the Swami and Dawa industrial parks. Establish new industrial parks and free zones in the industry-deprived regions. And under the One Million Jobs Plan, which we have christened Ejumapa, will generate an average of 250,000 decent jobs every year. Our job creation policies would be rapidly deployed through needed interventions that are applied to ensure that all sectors of the economy give priority to the creation of sustainable and decent jobs. The one million jobs will be anchored on the big push, an aggressive infrastructure development for jobs. The 10 billion investment over five years will stimulate the economy and provide opportunities for businesses to grow, create new entrepreneurs, and employ more people. A national apprenticeship program to train technically skilled human resources for rapid industrialization job creation and entrepreneurship will be implemented. NAP, as we call it, will target 500,000 out-of-school youth, including Kayaye. <laughs> Governments will bear the cost of fees for their training, and they will receive staff-up kits on completion of their training. What this means is that we'll register master craftsmen in all the districts around the country, we'll register youth that are interested in going as apprentices to learn a skill, and we'll pay the master craftsmen to train them, and when they are finished, we'll give them the kits that they need to start work, whether sewing machines or hair dryers. Through a number of tax exemptions, micro, small, and medium enterprises will be able to plow back their profits, and drive the digitization of the economy to provide new jobs. Encourage establishment of new businesses, focusing on exports to help create more job opportunities. Uh, provide free training and coding to young people across the country. Engage a minimum of 300,000 beneficiaries under the Youth Employment Agency. Focus on skills acquisition. Legalize and regulate Okada. Legalize and regulate Okada business in order to make it in order to make it safer and be an avenue for employment. Convert the labor office into a national employment center with offices in all the regions. Persons seeking jobs can register online, and employers who recruit from the National Employment Center database will receive tax incentives. It will also compile and maintain a national employment dashboard 
to track the number of jobs created every year. And um, find, getting to the end, social housing. Um, roll out social housing, I said that already in every district. Implement a national mortgage assistance scheme and rent to pay agreements over 15 to 20 years. So if you are working and you have between 15 and 20 years to the end of your working life, you can be allocated one of the houses. The money you'd have paid for rent, you use it to pay and own the house. The mortgages, the mortgages will be priced in CDs, not in dollars, so that we, we insulate the house owners from the escalating uh, uh, value of the dollar. Um, the rest is expand GIFEC to create a digital economy development fund to promote entrepreneurs with emphasis on youth and females. So GIFEC will help young entrepreneurs who want to go into digital services. Roll out a solid digital infrastructure to generate incremental value of more than five billion uh, uh, in a year. Develop a digital Ghana master plan. Ensure the efficient transfer of digital technologies and skills to unleash the innovative and entrepreneurial potentials of our young people. Commence the building of a national information highway, that's the Ghana Broadband Network, which utilizes 5G and fiber optic technologies. Move to an affordable universal licensing regime, including 5G, that allows flexibility for telecom companies to tap into new technologies. Identify and support young people to develop e-applications to support the delivery of public services. Introduce a uniform transactions fee to guide the electronic payments industry. Migrate all persons, migrate all persons to government payments onto electronic platforms. This is to speed up the achievement of a cashless society. And so these are some of the um, uh, uh, programs planned. There are many, it's uh, a quite detailed manifesto. And so I'll take a break here and I'll invite my running mate to go through uh, some portions on human development. And then after that, I will come and wrap up. Nana. The school has been piled up that they now let people go.
Thank you very much for the kind welcome. Uh, Your Excellency, please allow me to refer to the protocol already established and to thank everybody for being here, those who are physically here, those who are watching from elsewhere. We are very grateful for your attention. Today is September 7th, and we are exactly three months away from the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. This election will be historic in many ways. It will be the first time that such an election has been conducted in the midst of a global pandemic. It will be decided by the largest electorate in the nation's history. It will be the first in the Fourth Republic to be contested by a former president and the first in which a major party's ticket will feature a woman. But the moment also brings with it another more important, more urgent historical milestone. And that should guide our priorities as a people and shape the focus of our government in the years to come. This will be the youngest electorate in the history of this nation. Seven out of every 10 people who registered to cast a ballot on December 7th were born about a decade before the Fourth Republic. Nearly half of them have only ever known Ghana as a multi-party multi democracy. Isn't that interesting? And so in many ways, this election is about the future of the many millions who make up a rising generation with grand global aspirations for themselves, for their culture, and for their country. It is their ambitions, their energies, and their self-belief that will write the next chapters in Ghana's history. The future of this nation, its fortunes, and its very fate hinges on their ability to attain their fullest potential. The passion, positivity, and promise of the youth are the fuel for any serious agenda for the future of this country. It is for this reason that we must be invested in the success of the teeming youth of this country. Why we must be absolutely relentless in our determination to create a social, economic, cultural, and political environment that allows them to prosper and live dignified lives in a nation they can be proud of. And in many respects, it is about jobs, sustainable jobs. We cannot guarantee them, the youth, equality of outcomes, but we should certainly guarantee them equality of opportunity. This is the commitment of the People's Manifesto. The reason why we were not swayed by the criticism that by going to the people, uh, and, and the people, you know, the list includes the chiefs, the artisans, students, farmers, traders, teachers, market women, professionals, and so on, and inviting them to be active participants in policies that will affect their own lives meant that the NDC lacked ideas. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, do allow me to state that any plan that excludes the agency of the, of the recipient is at best an alienating effort. As a party that respects people regardless, our manifesto must perforce carry the voices and hopes of our people who will eventually own the outcomes. The easiest process 
would have been to lock a few people in a room for a couple of weeks, backed by consultants who have no clues, who sometimes have no clue as to the concrete reality of the life of the people of our country, and then call the outcome a manifesto for Ghana. At the core of the consensus expressed was human development. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the economy is about human development. No more, no less. It is about building a strong, well-educated, healthy country that protects the vulnerable, creates and sustains spaces for the aspirations of everyone to develop to their full potential, and rightly so. For Ghana can only rise to the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century if we face it with the full complement of our ingenuity and talent. And we can only do it if we eliminate the barriers of gender, geography, poverty, that excludes so many people from reaching their potential. This, my friends and countrymen, is the work of the next four years and a prerequisite for the future that lies beyond. We owe it to our youth especially, to their determination to succeed, their ambitions, unlimited energies and, and intellectual prowess that one finds everywhere in our country to help raise their levels of confidence to believe that they can overcome their general current cynicism and pervading frustration and become hopeful. And we know that the disappointments and disillusionment of the last few years means we must proffer concrete plans and not just promises. We will not offer our youth charity we will collectively work towards making them truly independent. This explains everybody's involvement in crafting this manifesto, especially the voices of our youth. This is the commitment of the People's Manifesto to the youth of Ghana. The manifesto highlights Please permit me to share the highlights of the wishes of the people, of our people, in these critical areas, beginning with education. The underlying principles reside in the conviction that every Ghanaian, regardless, deserves quality, relevant education with a thrust towards inclusive education, lifelong learning, that admits varying skills and competencies. We don't all have to do the same thing. We have a plan for education. The next NDC government will commence the Next Generation Education Initiative. This is a program that will enable the Ghana Education Service to provide basic and senior high school students access to interactive remote learning. This investment and actually we started that in our previous term with the iCampus Ghana and the iBox. This investment in the future will enhance the availability of digital learning, resource, of digital learning resources for schools. By integrating technology into the learning environment, ensuring universal inter internet access to these institutions, and providing students and teachers with devices, we intend to bring our education system into the 21st century. These tools and technologies will facilitate digital teaching and learning and keep teachers and students connected in and out of the classroom. Most importantly, it will improve the quality of education. It will encourage intellectual curiosity and it will help us close the inequalities in our education system. We have every plan and desire to make the free SHS much better by ensuring that its numerous challenges are addressed and that higher operational and academic standards are introduced and sustained. To do this, 
we will abolish the double track system. And as His Excellency has already said, we will complete all abandoned structures for secondary and technical education. This includes the score of e-blocks abandoned by this government for no justifiable reason. These measures will allow us to cater for current and future students. And we plan to make the free SHS more inclusive by expanding it to cover students in private senior high schools in underserved and deprived parts of our country. I had a singular privilege of leading one of Ghana's premier universities, and I have seen close up the challenges that tertiary students face, and of course those of their families and their friends too. And this informs our agenda for the nation's universities and their students. First, please let me reiterate that we are unequivocally and unashamedly opposed to the public university bill. It is a weak attempt to introduce political control over our universities and to erode academic freedom and institutional autonomy. As we, and we stand with the faculty and leadership of our public universities in opposing this grotesque overreach. We know how COVID-19 has impacted an already weak economy and personal finances. And we must not let, let this become another barrier to opportunity. That is why the next NDC administration will absorb 50% of fees for tertiary students for the 2020 2021 academic year as an incentive to mitigate the, the effects of COVID-19 on students and their families. As a long-term investment in financial access beyond the recovery, we intend to increase the student loan amounts to, make, to be commensurate with prevailing educational costs. We will restore the, the Student Loan Plus initiative that we created, which takes care of newly admitted students who are facing financial difficulty, even in paying the admission fees. These loan repayments will only begin when beneficiaries gain employment after school. We also recognize that many inequities that virtual learning during this, uh, this pandemic has laid bare. So we will provide free laptops to tertiary students to facilitate participation in online classes. We will also establish free Wi-Fi zones in all public and private tertiary institutions. His Excellency has already talked about the establishment of new universities. Our commitment to increasing access to education is at the heart of our free TVET policy. It is a plan to provide the free technical and vocational education at the secondary and tertiary levels. We will complement this with a program for the establishment of an ultra molding and fit for purpose technical institutes in our regions, in the regions that do not have any. And to maximize early career opportunities, we will also implement a national apprenticeship program and a national internship program. We shall address head on the problem of examination mal malpractices and restore the credibility and sanctity of examinations conducted by WIEC. Quality education also depends on having good teachers, well-trained teachers, and having enough of them 
So we will abolish the mandatory national service and teacher licensure examination for graduate teachers. And we will restore the automatic employment of newly trained teachers to improve the teacher-student ratio across the country whilst we consider those who have studied via distance. Now, healthcare. We have a plan for better healthcare and improved public health. We in the NDC believe that quality, affordable treatment should not be determined by where you live or how much money you earn. These barriers to cost and distance continue to exclude millions of Ghanaians from care, from care that they need, causing them to delay seeking care or to forego it altogether. This is why the next NDC government is going to institute the free primary health care. And I think this will be well articulated by our flag bearer. But access to primary care is, not, is just one piece of the puzzle. We need to build more clinics, as he has said, train more people in diverse healthcare delivery. To maximize the reach of our healthcare system, we will redeploy the abandoned Onyado mobile clinic vans to take healthcare to the underserved and to the hard to reach communities. And we will build and introduce the Onya, the Onipenya hospital ship to provide medical services to riverine and fishing communities along the Volta River that are inaccessible by road. Chronic illnesses are killing more and more Ghanaians, and they are killing them younger and younger. And it is adding insult to injury when healthcare costs make it difficult for them to get the treatments and medication they need to stay alive. So we will establish a cancer and kidney trust fund to support Ghanaians who need assistance for such conditions. <laughs> to focus our attention on the grave risks that non-communicable diseases pose, we will also declare renal failure, diabetes, hypertension, and national health emergency. This will allow for an unprecedented investment towards providing better access to affordable treatment for persons suffering from these illnesses and who cannot afford to pay for them. Much of the cost of healthcare is determined by cost of medications. We will introduce a policy of framework contracting for, for pharmaceuticals in order to lower the cost of drugs in our health system and we will empower the local pharmaceutical industry to produce more generics to feed the domestic drug market as we, be, as we started in our last administration. Of course, we'll also look to our own indigenous knowledge systems for alternatives, in order, and we will we'll do this by collaborating with traditional herbal medicine producers for rapid integration of herbal medicine in Ghana's systems. But a healthcare system is only as good as the healthcare workers within it. How many they are, how diverse they are, how well trained they are. So we'll employ qualified health professionals in search of work. We will train more personnel in domiciliary and palliative care to address the healthcare of the elderly and the sick. We will establish and in, initiate a plan for the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives. And in honor of an African giant, we will establish the Professor Jacob Plant Rule Endowment Fund for medical and surgical specialist training. A good healthcare system needs guardrails. We are at our most vulnerable when we are in need of care and must be able to trust healthcare workers to act professionally to keep us safe and to respect our dignity. So in the interest of accountability, we plan to establish a Patients Protection Council to fully implement 
Patients' Rights Charter. But when healthcare workers distinguish themselves through excellence or sacrifice, that should be acknowledged and rewarded too. The next NDC government will institute a National Health Workers' Day and establish an award scheme to deserving practitioners and facilities. And we will extend this to, private, to the private sector as well. But our health system must also be responsive to new realities. The perils of COVID-19 have shown the value of capital investment in health infrastructure. And no fair-minded person can ignore how critical the University of Ghana Medical School, the Gar East Hospital, the Bank Hospital, and many others have been to Ghana's effort in this pandemic. And kudos to our incoming president. While we cannot predict the next pandemic, we must be prepared. The lessons from COVID-19 are that a reactionary response will hamper our ability to contain the situation, and that has terrible consequences for our lives and for our livelihoods. So we must be proactive. We must conduct and we will conduct a thorough study of our public health and clinical response to COVID-19. We will review the economic incentives and reliefs to understand who really benefited from them. And we will conduct a value for money audit on procurement and spending during this pandemic, including pricing and availability of tests, protective equipment, and medications. We will make those findings public in the spirit of transparency and accountability. And those lessons will inform the development of a national infectious disease plan, one that allows us to mount a faster public health response, to provide more targeted economic support in its wake, to guard against the selfish greed of profiteers and fraudsters, to ensure politics does not triumph over truth and science, and ultimately to save lives. We owe our people equal opportunity to seek justice. Our newspaper, had, hi, sorry, our newspaper headlines continue to show how poverty and gender can be barriers to legal recourse. These inter intersect in terrible ways to protect perpetrators of gender-based violence from the law. This is an affront to our own founding ideals of freedom and justice. So we intend to resource and operationalize the Victim Support Fund under the Domestic Violence Act. And we will implement the strategic plan of action to address gender-based violence. This is a commitment to provide mental health care for gender-based violence survivors, to create a national hotline to address gender-based violence, to harmonize the law to ensure survivors of gender violence, especially rape victims, are able to access free healthcare services and to enforce the Trafficking Against Persons Act. And to ensure that poverty is no longer a barrier to competent representation in our courts, we will increase resources for public defenders and expand the Ghana Legal Aid Commission to increase access to justice for the poor and the indigent. So on social justice for our people with disabilities. Central to our political identity as social democrats is a belief of equity and inclusion. We are invested in removing the barriers that exclude any Ghanaian from reaching their full potential, especially those potentials of gender and disability that worsen inequality in our society. Ghanaians living with disabilities continue to inspire with their tenacity, with their resilience, and we as a society 
must meet them with humility, with humanity, and be responsive to their needs. And this should not be done out of pity, but out of a sense of justice and a desire to do what is right. I was proud to hear the promise that His Excellency John Mahama made to the disabled community in WA last week. This government's decision to reduce the share, the current government's decision to reduce the share of the district common, of the district assembly common fund allocated to disabled persons by a third is not acceptable. It is a failure of moral leadership on this matter, and it shows lack of interest in equity and inclusion. And that is why we pledge to review this decision. And because inclusion often means physical access for persons with disabilities, we intend to expand and enforce the laws governing physical access to public buildings for persons with disability and to ensure compliance of government buildings across the nation. Again, this is a moral priority. It is not a political one. Our commitment to social justice extends to gender. I'm living proof of it. But as I said a few weeks ago, the measure of a person's character is how you extend privilege to others. I believe that by, by holding the doors open and making many more women have opportunity to participate in this in, in nation building, we will receive other ideas, fresh ideas, fresh perspectives that will bring to our nation's development and that will also save our lives and guarantee the lifeblood of progress. Empowering more women will make our politics and government governance more dynamic, more vibrant, more responsive, more inclusive. And in this hour of crisis, Ghana has never needed that freshness, energy, and optimism more than she does right now. Those of us as gatekeepers must recognize this. We must embrace it. We must facilitate others coming through the door. Therefore, the commitment to increase the participation of women in governance is not an ideal one. We will focus that effort on the youth so that government of this country better reflects its gender and age demographics. The history of this nation has borne born out over and over again the power and potential of young people, including women, to move justice, inclusion, and accountability in governance forward. And while this sometimes means political opportunities, it has sense to so much more. That is why we intend to implement the Affirmative Action Bill. If it's not passed, we'll pass it, of course. This is a first step in the direction of justice for Ghanaian women and our centuries of contributions to this nation and the peoples that comprise it. But women face other challenges too. Poverty forces thousands of young girls in Ghana to miss as many as five days of school every month simply because they cannot afford sanitary pads. This is unacceptable and it is unfair. So we will provide free sanitary pads for girls to ensure that a perfectly, that a perfectly natural, perfectly normal part of their lives functioning does not become a barrier to education and a better life. So we will focus on girls under 20 who are in school. This is a problem we should have left behind us in the last century and which we, are, we try to address in our, last government, in our last government. Our opposition ridiculed this idea, but then let us hope the lessons of governance have made them much, much wiser. 
And as these girls become women, those complexes, those challenges become even more complicated, if not complex. For many young women in the workplace, having a child is a big decision because of what it can mean for their career trajectory. Balancing the demands of office life, the needs of a newborn, and the societal expectations around childcare present real challenges for working mothers. And when the kids are still babies, care and feeding means time off from work. Three months certainly is not enough for that. Women often have to rely on their annual leave to supplement their maternity leave. And any mother will tell you that that means a whole year work with no time off. So, we will extend maternity leave from three to four months. And we will also offer seven days of paternity leave. Childcare itself is another, becomes another obstacle. When young families cannot afford childcare, or have no one to lean, to lean on for support, it is the women whose careers and aspirations suffer the consequences. So as part of our plan to invest in early childhood development, we will work to ensure that creches, daycare centers, and nurseries for children are established in formal workplaces. For example, the ministries complex, and let's say our markets too. But women also face unique threats. Sexual violence is one of them. Our current system of serving justice to victims and perpetrators is beneath the dignity of this nation and of the women who love and who nurture this nation. This needs to change. And that means comprehensive systemic reform. The time is now. So in addition to the criminal justice reforms that I've already outlined, we intend to abolish all charges for medical examinations for victims of sexual assault. It is an abominable disincentive for many women, and it is also only more so the poorer they are. This is morally unacceptable, and there's no justice in that. I want two men of this country to know that these commitments we make for you today are also personal for me. I intend to see them done. We have waited for too long, and the time for action is now. We in the NDC believe that another measure of our national character is in how the most vulnerable are treated. We have a long way to go on this path, but we have a plan for that too. We intend to establish an orphan and vulnerable child support scheme as a special vehicle to protect the rights and interests of vulnerable children. And we will promote the construction and upgrading of shelters for vulnerable persons, such as survivors of gender-based violence and trafficked persons. And to my friends, the Kayaye, in our urban centers, and those who, are, who form part of the extremely vulnerable group because of their gender or because of their poverty status, we will introduce skills training, social assistance programs, in order to ensure that we stall the flow of such women into environments that are not protective at all. We will establish a center of excellence for training social workers to take care of vulnerable, including the elderly, and recognizing the needs and challenges of aging in our time. We will also amend the National Health Insurance Act to reduce the age of eligibility for premium payment under the National Health Insurance Scheme from 70 to 65.
and recognizing the challenges that young persons living with disabilities face in accessing education, we are committed to providing them with free tertiary education. Our senior citizens deserve our respect and compassion, which comes and lynching of the aged do not belong to this era. The NDC is determined to stimulate public education and to change the fortunes of the elderly and to bring the perpetrators to book. The next NDC government will support the Department of Social Welfare to create day centers and homes for the aged. Reactivate the Urban Elderly Welfare Card to enable Ghanaians above 60 years have priority access to social services, and we shall amend Section 29H of the National Health Insurance Act 2012 to enable all persons age 60 and above to be exempt from premium payment under the NHIS. The NDC recognizes historical inequalities between our Zongos deprived urban settlements and other communities. The next NDC government will provide regular funding through the District Assembly Common Fund for the development of the Zongos and deprived urban settlements to, to bridge the inequality gap, strengthen and resource the Islamic education unit under the Ghana Education Service to enable the unit to monitor and recruit more Islamic and Arabic tutors, establish, establish two senior Islamic senior high schools in the southern and northern sectors for the Zongo communities and others, support the only Islamic College of Education, which we established during my tenure as Minister for Education by revisiting abandoned infrastructure and providing logistics to enable them recruit and train more teachers. We shall award scholarships to brilliant but needy students in these deprived communities. And especially, we will focus on girls in medical, nursing, educational training. We also intend to provide mentorship programs and opportunities for the youth in these areas. Support Arabic teachers in the Makaranta with monthly allowances. Enroll youth in Zongo and deprived settlements into the National Apprenticeship Program, as well as ensure that they benefit under the free technical and vocational education and training. That is a free TVET. We will endeavor to ensure that a representative from the Muslim Ummah is placed on the board of the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs. It's all about fairness, it's all about equity. We shall liaise with some banks and other financial institutions to launch the Zongo Housing Scheme to provide support for affordable housing in the Zongos and deprived urban settlements. The NDC is committed to prioritizing youth development through various youth empowerment and entrepreneurship policies and programs. We take cognizance of the growing disappointment and frustration among the youth as a result of high unemployment, which has been worsened by ill-conceived and poorly managed policies of the current administration. The next NDC government will harness the potential of our youth by implementing comprehensive, multifaceted, and innovative programs. We will also provide a more effective institutional framework for empowering our youth for national development. We will have a stand-alone ministry for youth, for youth development. The ministry, the ministry for youth development will advance our youth empowerment agenda. It will mainstream and prioritize youth issues, coordinate the implementation of comprehensive youth development policies 
and related agencies address the multifaceted issues confronting the various categories of youth in the country, coordinate entrepreneurship and skills training opportunities for all young persons, especially vulnerable youth groups, facilitate youth participation in decision-making at all levels for national development, build the capacities of our youth and create more employment, decentralize the labor office. His Excellency has already talked about it. The One Million Coders program is an initiative that will be implemented through a public-private partnership to provide tr free training to about one million youth with knowledge and skills for coding and programming, web developing, apps developing, expand opportunities in the knowledge and ICT-based economy. In closing, I'll make a few comments. Our manifesto, the People's Manifesto, has been well thought out. What makes it credible is that we have a dependable track record to back it up. The, peop the people believe in us because if it is about infrastructure, if it is about healthcare facilities, if it is about schools, if it's about roads, our track record towers above that of anyone. We have no reason to falsely lay claim to projects initiated by another government and even forge non-existent ones. Ghanaians believe us because there's evidence of what we can do and what we do with the revenues and loans we contract. The people believe us when we say we are Democrats because we are. We do not hunt and taunt those who disagree with us because we cherish freedom of speech. We believe the true test of leadership is to eschew arrogance. We do not set out to collapse businesses of those who do not belong to our party. We are a party of fair-minded people. We believe in equal opportunity and so we give every Ghanaian his or her due. We believe in adding to what we, we inherit. We do not destroy what others have told to create so that anyone will reap why they have not sown. What we have experienced in this country over the, over the last couple of years does not augur well for our country. Nepotism, cronyism, masquerading as business it's not good for us. Ghana should not endure more of that. Over the next three months, we will carry our message of progress and inclusion to every corner of our country. We look forward eagerly to contrast our vision for the next four years and beyond with any other contestants. This election is going to be about trust. It's going to be about judgment and vision. John Mahama showed all three in the first major decision he made as part of his governance plan for 2021 and beyond. That is His Excellency Mahama's vision for progress. And that is the vision I joined this ticket to help him to realize. I trust and I believe in this vision. I have seen close up his thoughtfulness and the great value he places on introspection. We share a belief that growth, personal or otherwise, always means change. The President Mahama I know always seeks wisdom in the words even of his critics. He is interested in the views of everyone, especially the so-called common person. Always his abiding questions include, how does this suggestion help the poor, the vulnerable? How does this intervention improve lives? Such concerns resonate well with mine, and no doubt with those of many others who also believe that voting is an expression of hope, of trust, of judgment, of faith. 
their power to extend must, must be retained in ways that uphold the dignity of human life. That improves the trust of the citizenry in institutions that are expected to be fair, transparent, and protective. That is the character of the man, and that is why I am proud to be his partner in this vision for jobs, prosperity, and more. We, that is the NDC, we are a party for everyone. The farmer, the fisherman, the educated, the non-educated, the teacher, the nurse, the vulnerable, the market trader, the hawker, everyone is welcome. We welcome everyone regardless of status or background. And we invite you all to join us in building a prosperous country in peace and togetherness for the benefit of all Ghanaians. What we will not accept is a premise that Ghana belongs to some elite few who arrogate to themselves the right to determine among themselves how to share our precious resources. Let there be no doubt that this country, our beloved country called Ghana, belongs to all of us, including generations unborn. Let our actions bear witness to that. And those who receive the high privilege of being elected to serve must jealously hold and guard the sacred trust of the people. This we pledge to do. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please come join us. Let's spread the good news of the People's Manifesto. And on December 7th, join us again in reminding those who may have chosen to forget the truth that the people are the real owners of this country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let us conclude. Let us conclude. Um, and before I start, I'll acknowledge our traditional leaders. Um, when I opened my remarks, I didn't mention them. We are happy. Thank you very much for taking time to join us. And uh, just to fill in um, with uh, Professor Nana, with regards to the uh, Zungo and deprived urban communities, that's what we call it, not inner cities, Zungo and deprived urban communities. There is the establishment, there's establishment of a microfinance fund for Zungos and deprived urban communities, and it's called the Soyeya Fund. Ezu. Ezu. The fund, the fund will be accessible to all people who live within Zungos and deprived urban communities, and it will not discriminate. Um, in, in, in addition, I'll just mention a few uh, uh, things to do with sports, or as the sports fraternity will not forgive us. We'll establish a sports development fund, and um, we'll develop a comprehensive national sports policy to outline the vision and strategies for sports development in Ghana. We'll revive and invest in inter-school and colleges games in order to develop talent. For companies that invest in sports, we will facilitate tax exemption 
and tax relief regimes to motivate private sponsorship and promotion of sports. We'll promote and provide funding for the lesser known indigenous sports. We'll ensure the successful hosting and organization of the 13th Africa Games to be hosted in Ghana in September 2023. We will continue and complete the new Edubiase Sports Stadium and we we'll establish sports stadia and other recreational facilities in communities and in all the districts. Now this is an interesting one. We'll use the Sports Development Fund to assist the sports associations to provide and improve remuneration and welfare of local sportsmen and women. This fund will also be utilized to assist teams for teams that qualify for comp co uh, continental competitions. This fund will assist them to be able to uh, go and participate in the competition. And the final part, um, we'll vigorously reform and expand access to professional legal education. Um, honorable minority leaders spoke about that. We'll provide opportunities for all qualified LLB holders by granting accreditation to certified law faculties to undertake the professional law qualification course. He spoke about that. We'll establish high courts in the six newly created regions. And we will decentralize the services of the appeals courts by providing facilities for the appeals courts in the western, northern, and Volta regions. We will pay assemblymen, uh, members. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we will pay assembly members and give them responsibility for the collection of births and deaths statistics in their electoral areas. We will ensure the depoliticization of the civil and local government services. We will upgrade the whole Kaswa, Ashaman, Techiman, Koforidua, Sunyani, Bogatanga, Hohoi, and Wa municipal assemblies into metropolitan assemblies. We'll, we'll, we'll establish accounts for disabil the disability fund in every district. And so the uh, percentage meant for this, uh, uh, this, uh, the disability fund will be paid into a special account. 50% will go to paying a stipend to recognize persons living with disability in the district. And the other 50% will be used to invest in projects that will benefit the persons living with disability. Uh, security will implement the report of the inquiry into the Iwasu West Wagon vigilante incident. We will, we will empower the 48th Engineers Regiment to construct living accommodation for security personnel to establish new military presence and installations across the country, especially in the new regions that do not have a military installation. We'll establish a new military training and recruiting academy for the northern sector of the country. We'll establish a police station, a district police station in every district where there is none. We'll review and enforce medical packages for both serving and retired personnel and their families. We'll review the compensation package for personnel who lose their lives or get injured in the line of duty. We'll clear, we'll clear the backlog of promotions and ensure timely promotion based on merit and transparency. We'll depoliticize the Ghana Armed Forces and restore discipline and loyalty to the state. We'll encourage and expand opportunities for non-commissioned officers, that's other ranks, to access officer cadet training where appropriate. We'll construct housing units and residential accommodation for the Ghana Armed Forces, refurbish dilapidated and abandoned housing units across the country, systematically review upward salaries and allowances of troops 
and their civilian employees. Upgrade retirement benefits for personnel, establish armed forces home ownership schemes for armed forces personnel, complete and equip the Kumasi Military Hospital at Afari. Um, other things, I'll jump some of them. Establish armed forces agribusiness and processing units, revamp, revamp the defense industry to produce clothing, boots, and accessories for the Ghana Armed Forces and other security services. We'll expand and equip the field engineers corps to undertake national emergency projects, including road construction, and be licensed to undertake commercial ventures of the Ghana government. We'll roll out transparent and accessible police education and scholarship scheme. Will increase officer and residential accommodation for personnel of the Ghana Police Service. We'll complete the police hospital project. We'll construct a second police hospital in the northern part of the country. Complete the construct construction of the Dove Sioux headquarters, and I'm sure this is one that the police officers are waiting for. Use a yearly internal recruitment approach to grant amnesty to police personnel who privately acquired additional qualifications from recognized tertiary institutions, such that some of them can become officers each year through an accelerated promotion regime. We will maintain, we'll maintain the Cap 30 pension scheme for police service personnel. We will implement the Ghana Prisons Decongestion Project. We will modernize the prison system and make it more humane. We will provide facilities to separate remand prisoners from convicted prisoners. We will set up a special remand sentence review committee to review cases of persons uh, uh, accused of you know, um, light offenses. Encourage community service and other, other non-custodial sentences for minor offenders. Create well-equipped technical and vocational departments in all prisons. Ensure proper healthcare facilities in the prisons. Ensure safety and security of Ghanaians by reconstituting the joint military police um, anti-armed robbery patrols. We'll restore the visibility police. And so at every intersection, we'll have police in order to keep crime under control. We'll conduct investigations into the assassination of Ahmed Swali and other unsolved cases. <laughs> including the murder of the late Honorable J.B. Dankwa. We'll change the current climate of fear, intimidation, and harassment of the media. We'll continue the process towards passing the broadcasting bill. We'll develop a media development fund to support professional training of journalists and media organizations as part of COVID-19 relief package. The NDC will address the canker of nepotism and growing corruption. We'll restore the integrity and strengthen independent anti-corruption institutions and they'll be at the forefront of our fight against corruption. We'll strengthen the anti-corruption institutions like Traj, Yoko, the Financial Intelligence Center, the Office of Special Prosecutor, and empower them to investigate all cases of corruption swept under the carpet by this administration. They will also be empowered, they will also be empowered and free to investigate any incidents of corruption under the next NDC administration. We will introduce legislation to regulate agency representation and the conduct of business practices of multinational companies. This means that if a multinational company wants to do business in Ghana, it's not a crime to have an agent, but they will be compelled to disclose who their agencies, agents are for transparency, for purposes of transparency. Update the guidelines for political office holders developed and launched uh, during my administration. The presidency shall not act as a clearing house for corrupt appointees. Launch Operation Sting as a major anti-corruption crusade. Be relentless in efforts against corrupt political appointees and public sector workers. Amend the law to enable publication and audits 
of assets declaration forms by political and public office holders, codify the conflict of interest situations, make single source procurements or sole sourcing an exception and not the rule, create a fairer emolument system and remove the distortions between Article 71 office holders and other public sector employees. Reduce drastically the current size of ministers and their deputies. Reduce the number of political appointees at the presidency and other institutions. Reduce the number of ministries in order to save cost. Continue and complete the constitutional review process. Depoliticize the civil and public services. Roll out an aggressive social housing plan to deliver a minimum of 20,000 low-income low houses in all districts of Ghana. MMDAs will work with traditional authorities to acquire lands for the project. All materials for the housing will be sourced locally and will implement a national mortgage assistance scheme for security services and other public sector employees. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank the National Manifesto Committee for the diligent work that they did. It has taken them many sleepless nights to be able to complete this work. I believe that this is a manifesto that holds the key to the destiny of Ghana. It is possible, it is implementable, and I know that with the support of my running mate, Professor Nana Jinopoku Ajimai, the executives of our party and our government to be come January 7th, 2021, we will be able to implement this project, this manifesto. I know it's not going to be easy because we are looking at the numbers. We know we're going to inherit a very tattered economy. For those who pride themselves on economic management, I mean, they should really feel ashamed to hand over an economy like this to another administration. Highly distressed in terms of debt, budget and fiscal overruns, uncontrolled borrowing from the central bank now, and we understand the difficulties we're going to face. One of the first things we'll do is to achieve consensus on economic management. And so we will hold a second Sinchi conference, for those of you who remember Sinchi 1, which was boycotted by the NPP. I hope this time, even if they're in opposition, they will join us for Sinchi 2, so that we achieve consensus on economic management and fiscal consolidation going forward. I want to thank our National Executive Committee for the emergency meeting this morning to approve the manifesto. At this juncture, I'll invite my running mate, Nana, to come up and join me as we launch the manifesto. It is our honor and privilege to declare the 2020 Manifesto of the National Democratic Con Con uh, Congress with the theme Jobs and Prosperity for All, the People's Manifesto, duly launched. We, we also, we're also conscious of our persons living with disability. And so we did not only complete and launch the main manifesto, we also completed and we are launching today the Braille version of the NDC manifesto. Thank you very much and God richly bless all of us.
Pascual. Big, 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 big